let's think about first line treatments. Typically re recommended in the practice guidelines are the alpha-2 delta ligands, the gabapentinoids, so they're, so they're known as uh, tricyclic antidepressants. Clearly opioids and tramadol are recommended as second or third line options. Uh, in general, all the guidelines recognize these agents as systemic options with also topical lidocaine serving as a non-systemic approach, uh, especially for localized PHN, which is what it's, which is what it's approved for. Uh, let's review some of the clinical definitions and characteristics of, uh, of post-herpetic neuralgia. Uh, Charles, tell us a little bit about PHN. Well, PHN is a potentially disabling, horribly painful condition that occurs, most definitions, three to six months after an acute outbreak of shingles, most commonly occurring in the thoracic region, but can occur in any uh, setting. And, and it's the reactivation caused ultimately by the reactivation of the virus that causes chickenpox. Once it occurs, um, it's very difficult to get rid of. There's no clear intervention, and pharmacotherapy can be very, very helpful. But I think someone already mentioned that who wants to take medicine three, four times a day? Good data, good data about, Joe, I'm sure you're, in, I'm, you're all familiar with this. Good data suggests that even though 1,800 milligrams is the FDA-approved dose of gabapentin for post neuralgia, other data supports that, that what's being prescribed at the pharmacy for post neuralgia is 900 milligrams per day. So would half the dose of a chemotherapeutic agent be expected to help the person with cancer, half the dose of the antihypertensive, half the dose of the anti, you know what I'm saying. So why is this happening? Well, because people can't tolerate the gabapentin in its current form. And so there, fortunately, um, and some of, the, some of the newer guidelines, more practical guidelines, really suggest that there are, you, you, have, you have different options. So within gabapentin, you have, more than, you, have a, you have options that are more tolerable, you have options that are less tolerable. The clinician should choose, the, I mean, like, as my 12-year-old would say, duh, choose, choose, no, choose the option that is more tolerable. Who here wants to have an intolerable, you know, uh, um, uh, approach? Topical therapies, you know, can be more tolerable. The older guidelines don't even bring up the 8% capsaicin patch, which is FDA approved. Why not, you know, you, how, how many clinicians know that they, that can be used at the same time that the 5% lidocaine patch is being used, at the same time that a gabapentinoid can be used. And so, you know, the, these tools are available for us. And some of the guy I believe in guidelines, but some of the guidelines that go far enough in guidance, if you know what I mean. Of course. Uh, so, Chris, tell us a little bit about clinical characteristics. What does a PHN patient look like? Well, that requires a certain extent understanding of what PHN is. Uh, so here we have a virus that has been dormant in the spinal cord. It could be just about at any level, including at the cranial nerves. And at some point, it reactivates and begins to inflame the, the spinal cord presence itself, as well as the, the nerves that are emanating from that level of the spinal cord. So therefore, um, once that process is healed, what you're left with is some nerve damage at the levels that were originally involved. So what that leaves in its wake, um, which essentially occurs, the acute herpes zoster incidence is about one million cases per year in the USA. About 20% of those cases go on to develop post-herpetic neuralgia, and the symptoms that they present tends to be constant neuropathic, dysesthetic, burning, tingling, itching, gnawing, allodynic type of pain that is non-positional, non-mechanical, unlike, for example, somebody with pain that goes down the leg that is osteoarthritic or radicular that you can come off of, let's say by sitting or lying down, neuropathic pain you can't come off of. It's non-mechanical, non-orthopedic. That sort of has a mind of its own. For example, it can just spontaneously exacerbate for no apparent reason, or if somebody just taps you in the back, it tends to be worse at night. It tends to be associated with significant anxiety, depression, and sleep disturbances. And it tends to be extremely severe, one of the leading causes of suicide in the elderly, for example. So you need to pick up on the anxiety and depression component, as well as the neuropathic nociceptive component. That's great. So let's talk about who gets post-herpetic neuralgia. I mean, Chris tells us that it's reactivation of the herpes zoster virus, the virus that causes chicken pox. Uh, who's at risk for uh, getting PHN? Who get after, PH, after shingles, Joe, who's at risk for PHN? And I think it's the older population, there seems to be a higher tendency to these people, individuals who are immunosuppressed as well. Um, there's been some, some I think, uh, anecdotal information out there that would say even if you're in your 40s, if you're late 40s and you're very stressed, 
that this may be it. But I think uh, the patients that you really need to be concerned about are those who uh, are going to be immunosuppressed or an older patient population. So, so in addition, um, just that's, that, that's the biggest risk is age. And, and you know, several epidemiologic studies show that after age 60, especially, it's a dramatic increase. But being female, sorry, whoever is female, uh, but being female, having uh, significant pain before the rash occurs, and having a lot of pain with the rash, because very bad outbreak of a rash, they're all risk factors. Yeah. And so the primary care physician should be primed to that, you know. Sure, and not just risk factors for PHN, but risk factors for the severity of PHN exactly. as well. Yeah. yeah. I think we also need to be familiar with acute herpes zoster without a rash. So basically what we're dealing with here is a viral radiculopathy. So the virus reactivates in the spinal cord, it may or may not get to the skin. The transit time could be a couple of days, and during that time the body may recapture the virus, but the nerve is already damaged. Yeah. Uh